Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. Thank you for your support on Patreon, the craftsman Blake Carpenter. We have a new cruiserweight champion. Brizango become heavy machinery. It was kind of weird. And Walter becomes the first man to beat Kushida. I'm El Fagador Laurie Blake. Click the thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and give us a subscribe. And also, click the eye above my head to let us know who you think won the Wednesday Night War this week. Was it NXT? or AEW. Luke will be reviewing that overhyped t-shirt company show in a bit, but first I'm giving you the rundown of NXT for October the 9th. Things kick off with a hot opener over the newly renamed NXT Cruiserweight Championship. It's still the same belt and still utterly gross, but at least the ropes aren't purple now. Leo Rush was a really hungry challenger to Drew Gulak's title, coming out of the gate with Mach 5 feats of flying. But he eventually gets himself grounded like somebody who just flew a drone over Gatwick Airport after Gulak shoves him from the top rope, sending him crashing into the conveniently placed ring crew, who aren't there normally, so were clearly there for a spot. The closing moments following a tense submission battle sees Rush land a side-on frog splash, his impossible springboard cut a thing, and the final hour to pick up the victory and become the new cruiserweight champion. Big old Willie Riggs then comes out to present the title, but Gulak snatches it away before giving it over like it's a sort of angry present. I got this for you! Like it's a secret Santa he doesn't want to do. And then he gives him a respectful handshake, so that's nice. We're then reminded that Finn Balor is NXT and Tegan Knox has work. King knees. Then Rhea Ripley makes her way down to the ring for another squash match. And this time she moshes off Aaliyah, who foolishly decides to rake her back at one point, drawing the ire of Ripley and earning herself a ride on the big old swing. Which is sort of a figure four lock thing that Rhea uses to twirl Aaliyah through the air, slam her to the mat, and make her tap out. Post match, Rhea grabs a microphone and tells Baszler that she's coming for her. I'm glad they're positioning Ripley like this. It's time that Baszler was the one who was scared. Next up, we get the Benny Benassi remix of Brizango's entrance as the pair try to find satisfaction in a match against the East Base tag team Everrise. Except they don't, because Jackson Riker walks out onto the ramp carrying both lads from Everrise and then, um, just inserts Wesley Blake and Steve Cutler into a, a completely regular tag match with them. Oh, the villainy. It's unparalleled. It's horrible! So the match was built around a Fandango hot tag which kickstarted a rumba in the jungle, but the extra manpower in the sun's corner left Brizango in a certain way. Fittingly, that certain way is spelt with the phonetic letter Foxtrot. Uniform. Charlie. Kilo. Echo. Delta. Next up, Cameron Grimes literally squashes Boa with the leaping double stomp after Killian Dane distracts everyone by just being on the ramp. Grimes then grabs his hat and makes himself disappear like the swamp wizard he is, and then Dane decides to squash Boa some more, dumping him onto the announce table and saying, this is just the beginning. I guess will Dane just sort of, sort of start running rampant through the NXT roster now? I, I, I kind of hope so. Isaiah Swerve Scott then takes on Roderick Strong for the North American Championship and in a big swerve, Scott gets in a lot of offense and looks legit. Now he was kind of forgotten about in the breakout tournament despite feeling like the most ready-made star in his opening contest except maybe Angel Garza and his interchangeable trousers because that's always a winner. I absolutely loved this match between Strong and Scott and I thought it put over Swerve amazingly. Though not completely as he obviously comes a cropper to an undisputed era class finish, getting distracted by the lads on the outside, eating an end of heartache and then tapping out to the stronghold. Adam Cole then grabs a mic and says he loves NXT because the best of the best come here to see if they can measure up to the undisputed era, but that's just a dream. Did someone say dream? Because Velveteen Dream is on the balcony, like the sort of logical conclusion to Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, and he has a picture of Roderick Dong, or the lack thereof, and is sort of, this is somehow leading us to a North American rematch in two weeks' time. Fair enough. To cap it all off though, Tommaso Ciampa makes his way down to the ring, dragging a crutch, grabbing a chair, the era clear out, and he sits down and says, Goldie, Daddy's home. People react to this like Daddy Ciampa went out to get a packet of cigarettes 20 years ago and just go crazy. Like he's the prodigal son's return, the prodigal daddy. It was a great match, great promos, fantastic photo, 
wonderful daddy. The penultimate contest sees a fired up Dakota Kai take on Bianca Belair in a match that showed off what the captain of Team Kick can do, but ended with Belair picking up the quick victory with a KOD. This felt like the wrong choice, especially after Kai's emphatic return to NXT the other week, and especially as she took so much of this particular match. But I guess the post promo from Belair that sets her up for a match with Rhea Ripley is fine, so I'll forgive that. We're then told that we're getting Keith Lee versus Dominic. Nick Dijakovic number 75 next week is the main event and I honestly I couldn't be happier. That is a great match however many times you see it. And then finally it is time for the main event. Kushida versus Walter and who Boy, what a match this was. And it was basically streak versus streak, but not in a Roddy Dong sort of way. The story of the match was all about Kushida using speed to duck and wee through Walter's offense before eventually falling victim to the power game. There were some mad moments like Walter blocking a sunset flip powerbomb off the apron by stomping on Kushida's face. Walter taking the weird tornado hoverboard lock transition from the top rope. They even had this amazing submission trade-off sequence in the middle, swapping sleepers and arm bars over and over again. But it was the size advantage that seemed to prove too much as Walter finally hits the glory bomb, but Kushida kicked out. However, a ripcord lariat then does the deed instead. I think this was an incredible main event, made both guys look amazing, and Kushida lost absolutely nothing in defeat. And I also think it's kind of crazy that a televised WWE show had a main event with a Japanese guy and an Austrian who were both being billed as top stars. And not a single person's wife is cheating on them. Right, so it's almost time for AEW, but you can click the I above my head right now to give your rating for this week's NXT, where you can choose from an EST NXT, undisputedly good, the finest. Two out of five live and, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Cameron Grimes' hat. Now, to me, this week's NXT had a blistering opener and a really strong finish. Everything in between was definitely good, but we're clearly in the building phase after last week's blowout mini takeover episode. Now, there are feuds to set up and stories still to uncover. It's just that that middle hour felt like too much teasing and promising. And I get enough of that at home with the missus. So overall, I'm giving this week's NXT a low, undisputedly good. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, that was NXT. Now we're heading over to Luke for the AEW. Mm -hmm. I don't like this. This isn't good. Oh, where is. What? He's behind me, isn't he? <laughs> oh my god, Laurie, are you okay? Someone needs to help him! Maybe I need to be the one to help him! But first I'm gonna do this AEW review because the YouTube algorithm waits for no man. Private party advance in the tag title tournament. Darby Allen will face Chris Jericho next week and the mid card of evil gets themselves a brand new name. I am Luke Owen and this is my review of the 9th of October 2019 edition of AEW Dynamite. A stack night of wrestling kicked off with the tag title tournament match between the Young Bucks and Private Party. The latter of which were billed from a location you need a special invitation to. And there weight was described in Vodka Cranberry. Think if I was a wrestler, I'd have my weight announced in cups of tea. And it would be lots of cups of tea. This match was awesome. And not only highlighted why the Young Bucks are so bloody good, but why they signed Private Party to AEW. Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quinn are incredible wrestlers, and their tandem moves are often mind-blowing. The story of the match was the more it went on, the more frustrated the Bucks became. Seen as though they're supposed to be the number one seeds in the tournament, and Private Party are the number eight seeds. Private Party refused to die, and it led to a more vicious side of the Young Bucks. And after a series of really good near falls, Quen rolled up Matt Jackson off a reversed Meltzer driver for the shock upset win. It was an amazing showcase for Private Party and a really great story in them advancing over the experienced team. And if this is what we can expect from this tag tournament going forward, we're going to have a lot of great wrestling on TV in the coming weeks. AEW champion Chris Jericho came out with his cronies of Sammy Guevara, Jake Hager, Santana and Ortiz, who said that Dynamite was the highest rated premiere on TNT in 
many years, and that was all down to him and his brand new friends, including Sammy Guevara, who he called a Spanish god and shouted at us to look at just how bloody sexy he is, and also introduced the former LAX Santana and Ortiz, who he set up back alley brutes, and he likes them. However, when introducing Jake Hager, he was drowned out by chants of We The People, which was the chant for Hager's previous WWE gimmick when he was Jack Swagger. Jericho told everyone to shut up and said We The People sucked, calling it a stupid idea from bad creative. But remember, it's not a war. He also ran down Cody ahead of their Full Gear match in November and introduced this group as the Inner Circle, a possible reference to TV Inner Circle, which TNT used recently for feedback on the first episode of AEW. They also have a new t-shirt which crashed pro wrestling tees. I'll be honest, I was unconvinced about this group last week, fearing it would just be another mid-card of evil, but this one promo cemented them as a real faction. And Jake Hager is an incredibly intimidating presence standing behind Jericho. Why won't you blink, man? And Jericho is set to be in action next week when he defends his AEW championship against Darby Allin, who beat Jimmy Havoc in a very entertaining and very hard-hitting match. There was a nice bit of storytelling in the match as well, with Havoc continually biting Darby Allin's fingers, and Darby Allin did the same to him as he attempted the acid rainmaker, hitting the flipping stunner and coffin drop for the win. This put Darby Allin over so strong, and also established that Havoc could be in the AEW championship picture someday. AEW women's champion Riho teamed with Dr. Britt Baker to take on B Priestley and Amy Sakura in an entertaining tag bout, which was designed to further push Baker as a top contender, but also continue her feud with Priestley. It was also a really nice bit of commentary work when they pointed out that Riho's only loss in AEW came from a tag match where she teamed with Britt Baker. Amy Sakura had her moments to shine, including an impressive spear from outside the ropes to the inside and into the corner. It sounds weird, but trust me, it was great. The baby faces ran wild, and Baker picked up the win with the mandible claw on Sakura. She will face Riho next week for the AEW Women's Championship after this win and her win on AEW Dark. And then she brawled with B Priestley after the match, leaving Britt Baker with a nice shiner. Best Friends got a video package which Chuck Taylor called the best video he's ever seen, and it got the thumbs up approval from Orange Cassidy who got a massive pop. John Moxley made his official AEW in-ring debut next as he took on Sean Spears. Oh, sorry, did I say just John Moxley? My apologies, Justin Roberts. What I meant to say was John Moxley. Huh? This was another hard-hitting match, with Spears giving Moxley a Death Valley driver into the barricade which looked like actual death. Spears continued to work over Moxley before he made a comeback and hit the paradigm shift for the win. On top of that, we also had Pac out on commentary, who was asking a question that a lot of people were asking on Twitter when it was announced that Darby Allen and Jimmy Havoc would be fighting over the number one contendership. Despite Havoc picking up the winner all out, and Allen going the distance with Cody and beating Shima last week, Pac has a 2-0 record in AEW and has only been pinned once in two years. So where's my title shot? It's an interesting character direction for Pac and his feud with the concept of All Elite Wrestling. Furthered when Kenny Omega came out after the match to confront his full gear opponent Moxley, carrying a barbed wire bat and the far more deadly barbed wire mop. I seriously cannot wait for that to be a weapon in the AEW video game. Omega tossed Moxley the bat but was blindsided by Pac with a chair. This is different storylines between different characters crossing over, making AEW feel like a fleshed out world with various characters and various motivations. Motivations. And if you'll excuse the pun, I'm all in for that. And in the main event, Dustin Rose teamed with Hangman Page to take on Inner Circle of Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho, which was also awesome. This may not come as a surprise, but Dustin Rhodes is an excellent pro wrestler and Hangman Page is absolutely fantastic. The heels worked over Page for a long time, who did an excellent job of playing the babyface in peril, desperate to get the hot tag to Dustin, and the crowd got hotter and hotter as each tag tag attempt was thwarted. Finally, Dustin tagged in and ran wild, but interference from Jake Hager allowed Jericho to hit the Judas effect for the win. Inner Circle continued their beatdown after the match, but Cody appeared in the ring to make the save before being blindsided by Santana and Ortiz. MJF then ran down and in an excellent character moment, teased hitting Cody with the chair, but stuck with his best friend to lay out Inner Circle. But his heelish mannerisms led him to getting a code breaker from Jericho. It was a great babyface moment for the very heel MJF, a very well-defined 
three-dimensional character. The Young Bucks also ran down to get in on the action, and Darby Allen attacked Jericho with a skateboard to build their match next week. Jericho ended the show by calling Darby Allen a bitch, so you know this is super serious. So what did you think of the show? Vote in the poll above my head to let me know what you thought, where you can choose from all elite, AEW some, middle of the road, SC2 out of five, and what the fuck? Last week's debut was AEW setting out their stall of what you can expect going forward with Dynamite, but this show was all about building storylines and the characters. And while last week's show was a solid one, it was not without its issues. However, all of those issues were addressed this week. The production was smoother, the commentary was clearer in explaining referee decisions, and there was a nice balance of action and story. This was an excellent episode of Pro Wrestling. This week's AEW Dynamite is a very, very high AEW sum. Did Bray Wyatt agree with the criticisms of WWE's terrible booking of Helena Cell? Click the video to find out more and check out Screen Stalker Live where we were talking everything we know about the PlayStation 5. Thank you for watching and a special thank you to our Patreon pledge hammers, some of which you can see scrolling their way into my stomach. I've been Luke Owen and that was wrestling.